Welcome to On the Table, a podcast about board games, card games, and tabletop war games. Hey, it's Chase from On the Table Gaming, and welcome back to episode 81 of the On the Table Gaming podcast. And today, I'm really excited to be joined by Lockie Carter, who is an outstanding player from Australia, and he's going to talk us through an often neglected part of A Song of Ice and Fire, the Minters game. You know, we talk about balance and units and interplay, we're often talking about list combinations, and one of the big elements that you might forget is terrain and so you know i'm excited to explore this topic and Lockie, thank you so much for coming on the podcast uh thank you for having me it's uh really really actually really cool to be on to be honest you've been such a strong supporter of the game and kind of representing from the australian meta uh trying to um it's yeah i kind of just can be quite bullheaded so i get out <laughs> there and like to get involved in communities but um it locally with lockdown and all that, I think a couple of the other local players have gotten up and started getting involved in the wider um, international community. So um, hopefully it won't be just me. Well, that's amazing because I, I've always loved the contributions you've made on the Facebook page. You've been sharing a lot in the past about like even like really detailed breakdowns of game modes. And I you know I love the way you, you approach the game. So, you know, we ask this of a lot of people that we talk to, the way people approach A Song of Ice and Fire is often informed by other games they've played and kind of their, their gaming background and experience. You know, how did you find your way to A Song of Ice and Fire, the miniatures game? And, and what sort of games have you played in the past? Um, well, I found my way to A Song of Ice and Fire because I was looking for a, a medium to small scale fantasy game. Um, I had been looking for Skirmish, but I couldn't find anything. And Ash Barker from Guerrilla Miniature Games had uh, a series of the Song of Ice and Fire minis for a while. And I just watched them for like them and the On the Table or formerly Beast of War boys intros for it. I watched them and then found myself watching them over and over and again over the course of about three months. And then liked the minis. I liked that they were detailed enough that I could get uh, get some depth out of them uh painting wise but not so complicated that it would be a drag to paint them and then the mechanics really really sort of grabbed me and the way i guess i'd describe them is uh simple in actual rules but complex in execution uh so they're not that hard to learn but then to master and master them and do really well at the game you can you can get a lot of depth about how you you work with the game as a player and that really was what sort of got me into it alongside um, the tactics board idea and the cards and the way that sort of plays in it. Background-wise, I I do still currently um, play a lot of uh, competitive Infinity, I guess, Um, sort of involved in those communities as well. And that's a small-scale sci-fi skirmish game, and it's got a really, really on-point, on-edge competitive community that's quite international. And... uh, you have to be really like on edge with spatial awareness and sort of, uh, I think someone once mentioned it was like large working memory and the way that sort of all plays into being aware of what's happening on the table, what can happen on the table, adjusting to it. And it just sort of sucks you in. And I kind of find the same thing with this game. So that's where that came from. And that's then- so funny that you bring that up because a lot of the top competitive players we're seeing, that seems to be kind of the theme is that they're coming from this infinity background. Uh, Ron Krasnick's who ended up winning the uh, American national championship at PAX Unplugged. You know, he had a strong infinity background. So that's a definite game where we're seeing people coming from that have a very particular set of skills, uh, which I just found fascinating. Yeah, and I guess if I had to nail it down to any one thing i think it would be the ability or the practice in thinking multiple steps ahead in the game so in infinity there's this reaction order and every time you do something your opponent can respond Um, and so you constantly have to be thinking about if i do this what will happen Uh, and in song of ice and fire it's not as obvious but that same element is there with the alternate activation system like if i activate this unit what's going to happen elsewhere on the table type thing um, and I, and I'd probably credit that with a large source of why I guess we seem to be doing quite well. That's yeah, that's really interesting. Thinking about the game in such a complex way, I think that's really evident in the way you uh, talk about the game. And particularly, I'm thinking of some of your posts about you know game modes and really trying to like break things down so that people have like a foundation to work with. And what I thought was really interesting was that you were talking recently about terrain 
and a song of ice and fire and you know we've done articles and videos and we're always talking about like certain lists and strategies and combinations of cards and synergies but we we don't actually often hear people talking about the battlefield itself and particularly in this game where you can you can select that and you can shape that in some in some way so when a wise terrain choice and placement such a big deal in a song of ice and fire yeah, I actually think it's uh, one of the major decisions you can make about the game. So the way I look at it, you've got the three big decisions that will probably dictate or put you in a, put yourself in a position to be at a massive advantage throughout the game are list choice, terrain choice, and then deployment and deployment order sort of being the one thing and how you format your troops on the table. And with terrain, there's been discussions on, you know, like uh, people when the game was young, would always take weirwoods or right. files and stuff. But I think there's a lot more depth available in terms of pieces if you break them apart and stop looking at what's everyone else doing and start looking at, like, what is the best piece of terrain for what I want to do with the units I've chosen on the table? And, you know, that's you know, it is this part of the game that is a choice, right? Not only where you place, but what you are selecting on. You know, what should people maybe be thinking about in general? And then maybe we can talk about some specific pieces of terrain and how they might interact. But, you know, if you're sitting down at the table to play a game, um, should I just be thinking about like what synergizes with my army? Should I be thinking of like, what's a counter? Is this like an offensive tool? What is the general philosophy people might approach this with? Oh, that's a, that's a complicated one. Um, <laughs> I like the counters idea. It's not something I've had to look at too much personally until recently. And recently um, I've been getting my own way with regards to terrain placement and choice less and less. And so I am starting to have to consider counters a lot more. So I might not have as much to say on that, but certainly in terms of what pieces I ideally want on the table, I look at how do I want my list to be deployed at the end of round one like where do i want to be positioned uh how am i going to be prepared to take charges on the chin and counterattack? where can i get my units to be working on the board and then what pieces of terrain will allow me to execute that so one of the big and classic examples i guess is um i'm a stark player i love my bowmen always have <laughs> palisades and bowmen are just an amazing combination but it is also a combination that can work for for um, almost any range unit, and it has some additional benefits. Another one would be um, Baratheons, I guess, and walls. You know. Well, as a free folk player, I do not enjoy Palisades, <laughs> nor do I enjoy Stark Bowmen. But <laughs> that's yeah, like, that's no. the terrain piece that might be on the opposite side. I've had some not so great experiences. You know, you start to realize, man, the Palisade is so good at at uh you know kind of dividing up the board yeah yeah and i secret with your chase i play free folk as well and there we go the air out <laughs> well, that, this is amazing all right so you know you know thinking about the you know how it fits with your list and we're kind of getting to that right palisades with bowman that's a great combination because it's it's line of sight blocking and, and they don't really they don't really care about that right so they've got a great defensive edge but i think with palisades in particular one of the biggest things about them is kind of like the blocking line of fire is great, but for your range units, you know, you shift a little bit and you can draw a line from anywhere on your base type thing, right? Mm -hmm. And I know some people find it gamey, but it's the mechanics of the game. So the big thing I find for a Palisade is the way that it prevents charges. Like it's just a big block of terrain that your opponent cannot be positioned in. So if your front edge is, say, within four or three and a half inches of that piece of terrain, you know that you cannot be charged from the front right? Because there's just right. no place in there for your opponent to align. And I, I feel like that's kind of the strongest part of a Palisade. Um, and then uh, the other the other advantages of it, you know, as you pointed out, it completely wrecks certain armies by breaking up their formation, preventing them supporting each other. And it just changes the, it controls the table space. So another trick I, I, I've found that I quite like is if you're playing Baratheons and you've got a bunch of infantry that you want in the center of the table, having two palisades on the midline, just a little bit in, kind of like shortens the table by a foot. So instead of playing on like a four foot by four foot, you're now playing on like a three foot by four foot. And then mm. you don't have to worry about your flanks as much. Um, Interesting, yeah. yeah. 
Um, so Palisades, I think, are probably one of the obvious ones about uh, terrain because they're, there's nothing quite else like them uh, in that respect. Or maybe when people think of defensive terrain, maybe they often also think of like the, the low wall, you know, which gives uh, a few other defensive bonuses that are not necessarily as spatially related, but actually maybe more stats based. Yeah, for sure. So um, I guess uh, uh, the obvious one there is three plus save uh, infantry behind a, a, a wall will be tougher against range people. So I'm a, I'm a big proponent in the game of sort of combined arms. I think having a solid infantry line, having a long range component, if you have access to it, and having a cavalry component, again, if you have access to it. Sorry, Chase. That's all right. We have giants or we have swift advance, I guess, but Harma. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's just not the same. Or at least I'm <laughs> No, it's yeah. definitely not. I just say that to make myself feel better. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have, say, take a Baratheon Warden unit, right? Like it's five points, it's solid and defensive, and then you put it behind a wall, you're automatically stripping the opponent of their charge rerolls. You then, if they try to shoot you with range, they're at minus one to hit you. And then anything that does hit you, particularly in combat, because of the fortified rule, you're saving on a two plus. And statistically, right. that means that a three plus save that comes to two plus blocks 50% 50 um, more hits, right? Because instead oh, of failing yeah. on a one or a two, you fail only on a one. And that's huge. And it boggles my mind that more people aren't looking at that. It's not like Baratheons care about charging over them, right? Next thing you know, it's going to be this a plague of people being like, "Wait a second, like low walls oh, OP. <laughs> like they can have Mel, but don't let them have low walls." Oh, I mean, Mel, it is powerful. Mel. Two plus is but, is a daunting uh, unit to destroy, especially at five points. Right with twelve wounds, and oh. it's like, it punches you back every time you try and hit it. Yeah. In the Lannisters' case, you know, like um, they're working their supremacy to to, right. to do some real damage to you. So, I guess low walls I'd look at for units that want or want to mitigate the opponent's charge and want to mitigate the opponent's long range, um, particularly versus say, cavalry and archers and things like that. Um, and then I guess that the other uh, piece of terrain that people like to reach for defensively would be stakes, right? Right. Uh, Although I've definitely seen that that backfire sometimes, but but yeah, <laughs> big time, big time. Um, stakes, man, love hate relationship. I keep finding like I'll take them with my free folk and try to pull the whole pump up my giant for wounds trick. Mm -hmm. And then like, midway through the game, I'll be like, no, I need to eagle the unit that I want to charge, and suddenly I don't ignore the stakes anymore. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry, I you, you do ignore them. Yeah, yeah, and then you know, like I can't pull that trick and the stakes are just ruining me but um i find that they're really good as a defensive piece but when you want to be more aggressive with placing them on the table so maybe you want them right up in the opponent's face so that you can rush your infantry like behind them pretty quickly or you have a range unit that you want to have easier line of fire but you don't want it behind a low wall because of the way cover works and so you drop it behind stakes and i guess it kind of doesn't really need me to tell people but they're obviously really good versus solos i mean as much as i like hyping up a giant i still would be hesitant of char charging a giant over one because the idea of taking five wounds is just scary now this is also a, a terrain piece that it's kind of like the anti-wall where it's like we're talking about the baratheons getting such a better armor save you know 50 percent increase but at the same time if i'm playing against baratheons you know might it make sense for me to be taking stakes because you know, if I'm losing some free folk on spikes, meh. But if he's losing his like three plus armor save unit, those those auto wounds, that's a much more uh, a challenging choice. Not even to mention like the the hindering keyword messing with his his charges with their short movement. Yeah, for sure. They're definitely um they're the terrain piece that I think you'd take if you wanted a def uh, defensive position that punished elite troops and punished them powerfully. And the fact that it's like you can you can really stack up a lot of damage on stakes because it's every action you take. So like if something charges you and it clips the stakes and then it wants to surge forth, it's taking that damage twice if it tries to surge forth off the stakes. Just laughing. Yeah, I've definitely seen that happen. We were like, oh, wait, what? 
Yeah, like I've charged this unit and now I can't pull back into my line or I can't yeah. push forward through theirs and I'm just hanging in the breeze with my flank in the wind. I'm just thinking about the stakes though. I, I can definitely remember times when like a mountains men unit has like gotten into my troops and then they've taken like seven wounds, even though like I didn't get to hit back because they're trying to do stuff. Right. And they just evaporate. And it's <laughs> yeah, no, I, I do quite like stakes. I'm a fan of them. I just think you have to be you like you said, you know, you gotta be real careful with them because they can be like a massive double edged sword. Yeah. Uh, and I think they're the closest terrain piece to a palisade uh, in their ability to break up people's formations. Like nobody's going to care too much about a wall if they want to maintain their line mm -hmm. because, yeah, it's going to suck if it slows down a charge or something like that. But if you're the one being aggressive, the wall doesn't matter if it's on your side of the table. But the stakes if your opponents put them like to force you to split up your troops can be a real real pain in the neck to deal with and then we have some of the and that's like maybe one of the smaller pieces i think maybe it is the smallest piece well i think along, the same. alongside uh, the, the much maligned hedge <laughs> but yeah, but yeah hedges. maybe we can talk about hedges then let's just throw that in here then um well no know. um yeah What's to say about hedges? Hmm. Well, so I. Kind of... <laughs> oh, you go, you go. No, I have nothing. I got nothing. You got nothing. <laughs> you got. Uh, I mean, it's got. It's you know, rough. It's a great. Ball. Yeah, it's a bog <laughs> that's tiny. Um, I'd kind of written them off, and then um, I played in the NRG tournament lately, and uh, my loss was to Ariakis, who mm -hmm. I'm rooting for to win. Here's hoping that age as well. <laughs> um, he actually deployed a hedge in our game. Um, and I asked him why, because I was like, okay, like I've thought about hedges. I can't really think of them. Why I would want one over even a bog, which is same thing, but twice the size. And he actually pointed out that it's a really good null terrain piece. Like if you mm. want to occupy a space on the board, prevent your opponent putting terrain there and effectively make a choice by not making a choice, a hedge is a really, really good option. Interesting. Because who cares about them, right? Right. Wow. And then, That's a, <laughs> there's a slogan for people. <laughs> hedges, <laughs> who cares about them? They basically don't matter, and they matter so little that you can put them down as your, like, nullification. Uh, right. Like, like, area, you know, denial of other you terrain. Don't that, you don't want that palisade there? Fine. Put your hedge down there first. <laughs> that type of thing. Um, I was thinking about them sort of today a little bit. And um, I do think that there are probably some really niche ways where they work, where like you can't fit a full bog, but you could fit a hedge and you still want that disordered charge chance because mm -hmm. it's like 55%, if my maths are right, of rolling a one or a two when you roll the two dice mm. um, or being disordered or something. It's, it's pretty high. Um, and... Uh, so like if you want that and you can't get it or if you want a range unit that is resistant to charges but you don't want to deal with stakes like maybe you'll take a hedge then but they're pretty they're pretty niche on yeah that. and if someone's out there is like you know they're a fan of like the hedge knight and they're like i'm all about the hedges and that's your thing like let us know <laughs> like post something send us a comment we'd love to hear uh but I yeah think i'm Oh, I was going to say, I'm always for, for new ideas. Like anyone that figures out that something's working for them, like I don't care how it's working for you, teach teach others. And I think that ties back into sort of my whole deal. I like and sharing then, information. Yeah. And then kind of thinking about the difference in footprints here, though. So this is maybe some of the smaller pieces. Then we do have the larger things like the forest. Right. So the forest is an interesting one. I'd actually quite had it sort of personally in with the bog, uh, not the bog, the, the the hedge. I couldn't really figure out why I'd ever really want one, but I'd been playing Free Folk recently and getting my ass handed to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> that happens from time to time. By, yeah, right? Great fun. Um, largely by range units. And I kind of went, well, hold on. What can I do without necessarily changing my list too much and constantly mm -hmm. trying to chase what to take or how to deploy it 
what can I control? And that kind of comes back into this whole terrain being a control and, and ability thing. And I thought, Woods are great. They've got a huge footprint. They That neg one to hit for range units can be a massive difference. Like, I love mants and crossbows because suddenly I don't give a damn about them. And if a wood is basically giving me the impact of Mance, Raider as an NCU on a mm-hmm. huge chunk of the board, throw that down in the middle. Any range unit that wants to shoot at your center is now whiffling, you know? Um, and yeah, and they don't slow your charges down either, right? Like you're, you, they're not, they don't disorder you. They're not hindering. They're rough, but one inch rarely matters. And I always looked at this one also as, you know, another way with such a large footprint, maybe kind of more in that hedge manner of like, sometimes I could deny terrain just by placing a big forest, right? That has a, uh, a large zone at cast. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like, I like doing that. And if you get the chance, like do that first, throw it down in the center, you know, like you're totally happy with range, not being great. And I think that probably applies to maybe Baratheons as well. And surprisingly, kind of to Targaryens because they don't have really long range either. You know, they're, they're right. kind of stuck with um, yeah. just their short range. But it's something I need to look at and definitely more because it's only in the last couple of weeks that I've been seriously looking at, at woods. And then, you know, uh, the flip side of that literally is the bog. Um, yeah. And actually, I've been reaching this against some of my Baratheon players more and more. And, uh, Oh, you know, typically right. I wouldn't use it against cavalry, but even trying out the champions of the stag, like, you know, they are not very fast and, uh, you know, move it, slowing down some uh, movement is right. always, and is always fun. <laughs> bogs wreck them. It takes them like two turns, <laughs> two activations to get over a bog. It's horrible. But it like, I mean, if you can counter a 10 point unit with the clever placement and use of terrain, hell yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. That being right. said, I guess maybe not all cavalry would be, uh, you know, impacted that same way. But when you got, you know, movement speed of four, yeah, and dropping sure. down to three. But really um, I guess bogs for me, they were the first terrain I think I reached for. Uh, I played Starks and I played in the Lannisters. And so, like, corpse piles were just a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and I did find that the weirwood just didn't hit, help me enough, um, which I might mention when we get to it. But I found that because I was I, I'm naturally drawn to Rob Stark as a commander, I love mm-hmm. love the idea of fluidity and mobility. Um, and I've been running heavy calves since I started the game, so like two units or more if I can. I found the bogs were great at letting me because I was so much more mobile than my opponent, I could position around the bog and isolate a small piece of their army and kill it and use the bog to slow down the rest of their army mm. and then reposition around the bog or just straight over it because, you know, you move six and you get a free maneuver. Right. Um, and then you re-roll charge distances or something like that. Um, whereas my opponent would be super slowed by it. And so I guess, yeah, I... I I love bogs, big fat footprint, uh, great. If you're highly mobile, you have ways of ignoring hindering terrain. So free folk, Targaryens, Starks, or minimizing the impact of it. Um, but you still want to slow down the opponent so you can eat them piecemeal, I guess, um, is is where I go with bogs. What about you? you you use them up? Or? I mean, especially now I, for free folk, a hundred percent. I think now with ways to mitigate and avoid the effects of terrain, it's kind of a no brainer. And, and the, the large footprint uh, and especially against certain matchups, you know, I don't know. I think against Baratheons, it's hilarious, um, <laughs> but it's, you know, I've actually had a, a maybe now I, I should be probably keeping track, but it's several times where that uh, disordered charge has been like a, a game changer where it's like, well, they got to risk it if they want to make this this call and they go for it and, you know, they, they can't get through the bog. Right. And like going over the um, the disordered art charge dice too, like the the choosing the lowest, mm-hmm. that can punish long range oh. charges. Oh, yeah. Like if you can't get 
I'm in on a one and I'm just rolling for disordered, mm -hmm. I almost wouldn't bother charging over a bog because the odds of just whiffing it and getting stuck in the open and, oh, they're horrible. And that's why I'm really excited to see, actually, not to go off on too much of a tangent here, but as we see now, you know, more abilities being introduced that allow you to ignore terrain, um, you know, I'm thinking specifically of the free folk, uh, the eagle, mm. you know, that really adds a whole nother layer of, of how you can play. And I think it makes terrain choice, you know, exponentially more important if you can, you know, make your opponent be subjugated to it, but you can choose in, on instances to ignore it. And I think that's right. where like the bogs particularly shines. Maybe the stakes could be that way as well, but the bog just is so big and so um, takes up so much real estate. Yeah, and and like I love that the game is getting that aspect of your terrain choice is less about it, it's becoming less about what do I take to maximize what I want to do, and it's becoming more about well, hold on, how does that interact with what my opponent's doing, like. And, and as you said, eagles or Targaryens with, I think it's Daenerys, like mm -hmm. you can pick and choose where you want to yeah. ignore the terrain on the table. And that's massively powerful. Yeah. And if your opponent forgets about that and suddenly they got a, a unit of screamers or Dothraki veterans or something coming across their, at their unit. They're in for a, a world of work. <laughs> you know? And it's good. Or followers of bone. Or oh, yeah. Genre. You know, like just straight in up the guts and, and you're like, <laughs> oh, you're right. You know, he's he's got a massive chance of disordering and then suddenly you're like, oh, shit. Oh, <laughs> That's <damage."> exactly it. <laughs> you now, know, the, like, the last two terrain pieces, these are ones that for the longest time, I think were people's go-to. And, you know, when I first started out, you know, I was in that mindset too, where it's like, oh, I can see how, you know, corpse piles and where would they, you know, they have a direct correlation to, um, you know, damage or not taking damage on the battlefield and as a free folk player i remember initially like always taking uh weirwoods like wherever i could and uh being so scared of corpse piles and i feel like maybe over time and maybe as, as i got a little bit more skillful i've started to kind of see that i had maybe an error in my ways especially especially now after the morale changes where you know i'm not losing eight raiders at a time but maybe we start off with corpse piles. It's like, you know, what should people be thinking about? You know, what makes this so great? And then, you know, maybe what are people like over uh, emphasizing as well? So, yeah, uh, they are the, the interesting pieces of terrain, I, I, I find. And I know that I think locally, like as in locally in the US for you guys, that mm -hmm. uh, a lot of your terrain, I, I know there's a trend to choose random terrain in your events over player chosen. And I feel like a lot of the stories we were hearing was because people would just take weirwoods or corpse piles. Right. Um, and with corpse piles in particular, I think what people forget is that they are a double-edged sword. Like, yeah, you're net taking one morale away from the opponent, but if they're placed in the middle of the table, odds are that you that's where you're going to meet. That's where you're going to be both rolling dice and they're going to be having an effect on both of you almost equally unless you have a specific list for it uh, and you might find that they're doing as much damage to you um and then corpse files get weird because they're also a bog so everything that we've said about bog kind of applies to a corpse pile but if we just focus on the morale i think that um lists that should focus on choosing corpse piles really are only lists that like doing morale damage but at the same time have means of mitigating the morale damage that they take either through embolden um naturally low morale guard captains things like that because take um boltons for example they're mm -hmm. vicious armies they like doing panic damage but their morale isn't that great it's usually like six or seven you know you throw a corpse pile on and suddenly your cutthroats are saving on on eights you know they're not good odds uh but because of the vicious you don't really need the corpse pile to be pushing that damage through now under the more recent right. panic mechanics right because a fail is a fail it doesn't matter if you fail by an inch or a mile right you fail. um and so you should always keep in mind that um it can affect you and so 
you really need to be careful about whether or not you want to choose corpse piles. But there's an interesting kicker to that. And I think the interesting twist is the free folk because of the way their morale sits on the probability curve. Right. So with rolling 2d6, odds are that you roll a seven. I think it's 45% of the chance, uh, 45% of the time, roughly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so anybody lower morale than seven will pass more often than they fail. Um, and then, you know, if you're both suddenly at negative one, doesn't matter if they're five and you're seven now, or like if they go from four to five and you go from six to seven, you're still both failing at roughly the same ratio on the table that you would have been before. But with free folk, because they sit on the other side of the curve um, at morale eight, you know, they're going to be failing those morale tests anyway. <laughs> so they're like, well, I'm freaking dying. So why don't I take you with me? And I'll throw out a corpse pile and my morale can go to nine. And your morale can go to seven and we'll both die. And it'll all be great and glorious. And I've got more bodies than you. And also, you know, like, I don't mind losing uh, four four units or four uh, miniatures out of like a three point unit, and I'll I'll gladly trade those out of your six or seven point unit, right? Or like um, when flayed men were terrorizing everyone, oh, one geez. of my favorite ways of killing them was like, all right, I'll just make you fail because <laughs> they're only morale six. It's, it's good, but it's not great. No, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I think that's the realization I've started to come to is as free folk, like it's. I think I just had such a a block from before being so afraid when you would take right. like the full amount and then I'm like, oh, wait a second. Like, you know, really I, I doesn't matter anymore. yeah. And it's like, maybe actually if my opponents are going to try and go that route, it's like, okay, like good for me. Yeah. Right. Um, and it's interesting because there are free folk builds that do care though. Right? right. I know he's not popular, but man's Raider, right. You, know, uh, you throw him down. You don't want to be having corpse piles down because your morale goes from five to six, right? And you've right. just invested all these points in them. But I guess he ties well into Weirwoods and talking yes. about them. Because, like, you suddenly go from having a morale eight army that you're paying for <laughs> to a morale, if you've got Weirwoods and Mats, four plus. Right. Which is insane, points. right? <laughs> like, that is yeah. crazy. I love it. I love watching people charge raiders and being like, okay, <laughs> I did six wounds or eight wounds and you're down to one rank and just fail your panic test. And you're like, I'm on fours. And they're like, what? <laughs> like, yeah, I'm not going anywhere. You'll be here hitting me for three rounds, baby. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is where you live now. This is where I live. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, if that if that segues us into Weirwoods, I guess, you end up with... Um, them being interesting because, as I said, you know, corpse piles have that bog mechanic. So, like, forcing people to charge over them and then punching them when they're near the bog is really powerful. But with weirwoods, they just nobody cares. They're straight over them and a million miles an hour. Um, but they do affect both pit, both armies the same way that a bog does, but in the opposite direction. So what kind uh, of abilities, we talked about Mance, like what other abilities or keywords do you want to think about, you know, synergizing well with Weirwoods? We really want to double down on the on the morale component. I think the armies that really do well with Weirwoods um, are the armies that kind of don't lean into panic as their damage mechanic so much as they lean into, I'm going to do raw damage to you that punches through your armor. So big example would be Starks. Um, Targaryens would be another one um, because you know they're all about the sheer volume of attacks rather than mm-hmm. a couple of attacks and then force you to hit panic with vicious. Uh, and uh, Renly for Baratheons, I think, is another good one, and that kind of ties into the way embolden um, as a keyword. Oh, oh, yeah, really stacks with um, with um, weirwoods, and I think. More of us, and I say us because it's definitely something that's only kind of occurring to me recently, more of us are aware of that interaction now that Melisandre is kind of a thing. Right. Um, Because she's scary, but if I have an entire line of infantry, cavalry, whatever, and I've got them all clustered within 
six of a Weirwood and six of an Embolden unit. I don't think there's an Embolden in the game that doesn't make the surrounding units four plus at least. Mm -hmm. And with the negative three, that means that you're only failing to mel half the time. For a five point NCU, that's a big chunk out of her abilities. Right. Um, and she's, you know, she can risk it and, and deal more self wounds. But sure. Like she's not getting the bags. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, we'll, we'll take that's a, 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 you know, a risk to take. Yeah. And it, it really can change it. Um, uh, in the NRG tournament again, uh, I think it was my second or third game. Uh, I played a bloke using Mel, Fork on Full. Great bloke. But, um, I think I was able to capitalize on that game primarily because I did position with a Weirwood and some Tully Cavaliers uh, close to my lines just to proc up that plus two morale. And, um, you know, I'm playing Starks. I don't care. I'm, I'm doing damage through armor. You failing your morale versus me is just a bonus. You know, I won't plan for it as much. Uh, and it just kept me in the game. Um, yeah, so I think they work really well with Stalwart, Embolden. Um, I also think they're important if your opponent already has that morale edge. So, like, if you are playing into Mass Berserkers or Relaw Faithful, Anister Guard Captains, you may as well throw the Weirwood down because they're going to pass regardless. Oh, yeah, sort um, of like trying compensating yeah. factors or, like, you know, evens the field a little bit. Yeah, exactly. And like you're changing it for them less than you're changing it for you. Right. Uh, and I think that that and the inverse of that for the corpse pile and the weir would both sort of marry up together. So I think, you know, uh, I know there were some tournaments are going towards the sort of randomly generated terrain. Um, I know there are some places where they would have you pick terrain as part of your list. Mm -hmm. Which, but I think if you're if you're listening to this, you know, really be thinking about you know how can you pair your terrain with the lists that you're running, and you know it's a good mental exercise even to be like, okay, I'm going to play this list. Um, you know, what would help this list? What would hurt this list? Um, how would I maybe want to use space to open up certain opportunities? And then maybe think about you know are there other factions that you're playing that you you know like you were saying like well if they're going to have these bonuses. You know, right. I might as well give my bonus these bonuses to my faction anyway, and 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 sort of even the field. So it's a whole other way of thinking about the game. And and I think you know, oftentimes you don't spend as much time thinking on it, maybe, and then you get to the game and you're like, oh yeah, right, I need to do this, or you realize, man, I just took you know eight wounds from stakes. Maybe that wasn't the way to go. Yeah, and like one of the things I've always taken away from Infinity is that uh, uh, humans are kind of we're, we're not very good at making rush decisions right um our risk reward evaluation is just it's the biology behind it is just a mess um and so if you want to minimize the impact of that make all the decisions or the hard decisions that you want before the game and this comes into terrain like have the terrain that you want to use in mind and how you're going to use it and then when you rock up to the table you're not thinking oh, which piece should I use? You're thinking, I know I want this piece. I want it in this kind of position on the table. And all I have to do is look at the table and go, that's the spot that corresponds to how I want to use it. That's where it goes. Absolutely. And yeah, yeah. And, uh, free up some of that mental energy to focus on other things. Basically, yeah. And, and I think, I know a lot of what we've been talking about has been about player choice. And I do know that some metas do still prefer random or and probably will continue to. And, you know, like, if that's your jam, go nuts. But I do hope that what we've been talking about is still useful to those people. Like, it doesn't matter much if you pull a palisade, a hedge, a wall, kind of, uh, or stakes. Uh, if you're going to put them in front of the unit, they're all sort of doing the same thing. They're all keeping that unit alive, preventing it getting charged or hurting the opponent for charging them. But I guess with a specific list though, it's going to be, that's like the, the, the smaller nuance then, right? It's like specific lists like that will make all the difference. Yeah, I think so. And so like, it, you know, I guess the point I'm trying to sort of get at is if you roll up a hedge, but you would prefer a oh. palace, 
Mm -hmm. it kind of sucks but at the same time you can use the hedge in the same way that you would with a would a palace it's just less effective yeah well that's amazing Uh, well, yeah. and so, you know, you've been a long time, like I was saying before, you've been a, a, a long time supporter of the game and you've been, you know, really supportive in the Facebook groups as well. See your name pop up all the time. Uh, you know, you're down in Australia. Well, any any local stores or people you want to give shout outs to? Because that's a there great are, community. I feel like the Australian community, I feel like not, uh, this is not, I meant in a positive way, but like, I feel like you guys do a lot of good stuff and maybe not always getting the shout outs or the, the airtime here. Uh you make us blush. Um, <laughs> I'm probably the most vocal of us. So there's probably the most of the others. <laughs> are TV. And I'm just, no, I'll pick fights from people. <laughs> <laughs> but um, shout outs wise, uh, I really have to give one to the, the local boys that I game with. Um, Western Warriors, I think is what we're currently called. All right. Sydney. And uh, stores, um, there's three in Sydney that have been really good for the game. Like um, one of them's an online store. I think a few people will have heard of called uh, Toy Soldier Imports, and mm-hmm. I know the blokes that run it personally. And they uh, they basically run it just for the community, and they they've done the same thing for Infinity. So they've got a hell of a track record behind them. Um, and then stores that house events because you know it's it's not all about the online stores you need your bricks and mortar as well yeah. um the shout outs i'd have to give would be to um games empire in western sydney and uh hall of heroes down in campbelltown a hall of heroes runs monthly events for us and games empire has been incredibly helpful with getting stock in running events when he can and just just being there for the community so i'd love to give them a shout out um, and then there's a few of the Melbourne boys. You know, they're, they're pretty good. And uh, <laughs> I'm sure I've missed someone and someone's going to send me an angry message. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Don't piss off other Australians. They're going to come for you. <laughs> <laughs> they're mostly harmless. <laughs> <laughs> mostly harmless. I mean, I don't want to put into stereotypes here, but I feel like mostly harmless for you. You got like all sorts of crazy creatures and sharks and stuff. Mostly harmless in Australia is probably deadly everywhere else. So we'll see. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> I could tell you stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. And in the meantime, I hope you get your miniatures on the table. <laughs>